Greetings, YouTube. So I found myself con contemplating the concept there you go, um, of magic, no magic, and anti-magic. So in high fantasy or even low fantasy settings, magic exists in some variety. Uh, often they're divided into like arcane, divine, and psionic or psychic powers, which are sometimes viewed as not magic, but they often emulate magic very well. In fact, if you look at the first edition Pathfinder uh, psionic rules written by Dreamscard Pressed, the best set of psionic rules I've ever seen in my life, best spell point system ever written, this, the psionic powers are direct copies of the classic D&D spells. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. Um, but um, sometimes you can use magic or psionics to create a sphere, a little literal sphere, where magic doesn't work. So if you have magic and uh, magical uh, abilities currently on you, active from permanent or temporary spells, or you have magic items and you walk into this sphere of anti-magic, suddenly all of it shuts down and you are just a mundane person just like you or me. Um, but it's a spell. So even though you are currently in that sphere and currently just as mundane as you and I are right now listening to this video or making this video, that mundane state is being powered by magic. So you are not truly in a no magic zone. You may be in a no magic void temporarily. But that void exists within a magical universe. Now, I understand that there are people in this world, Earth, right now, the uh, 616 universe, if you like to say, who practice magic, who engage in magic. I'm one of them. I work magic. I use charms. Not something I do regularly, but I do do it. And it's all part of my religious practices. But nothing I do is like D&D. &D. It isn't in any way, shape, or form emulating the abilities of d and I would love to have the spell ca spellcasting abilities from Pathfinder First Edition. That would be just awesome because they are so darn powerful and so darn fun and there are so many things you could do with them and you could become so darn wealthy <laughs> um but to the best of my knowledge none of the things that you see in pathfinder or in D, &D exist in this world we live in a mundane universe there is no anti-magic Fueling, spells fueling their, our mundane state. It is just the very fabric of our reality. But if you're in a fantasy world or a sonically fueled world and you're in one of those bubbles, because I believe there's an anti-sionic option, a very variety of anti-magic, and you can have anti-magic sonic transparency where an anti-magic spell would also block psionics and an anti-sionic spell uh, power would block um, spells. Um, some people do keep them completely separate, but that's that's a that's doubling everything. That's 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 a lot of tracking. You know what I mean? You have to keep track of everything being completely separate, and and this will work when this doesn't work. And it, I prefer transparency, but that's just me. Oh. Because you often see anti magic as a tactical decision to eliminate an a, a, you know an enemy's ability to do something, but you better have people with you who are really good in a mundane environment. Um, otherwise, you, uh, in other words, you better have meat shields. And you better have meat shields who can step up and do what they do purely based on what they're carrying in the mundane world and their training. Because if you've successfully eliminated your, your enemy's capacity for spellcasting or the psionic use, doesn't mean they're not dangerous. There are things out there that are really dangerous in our world and do not require magic to be dangerous. <laughs> there are weather events, there are accidents, there are animals, all which are very dangerous to you. There are hazards that exist that are not fueled by magic or psionics and you better be prepared to handle them. And just because you have eliminated 
magic or psionics doesn't make those hazards or those dangers just go poof. If there's a bear, you better be able to take on a bear. And there could be a bear in an anti-magic sphere. There could be a dinosaur in an anti-magic sphere. There could be even da more dangerous creatures who have abilities that would still function because their abilities are biological. An anti-magic sphere doesn't mean that suddenly you're thrust into our universe where the square cubed law works. Because anti-magic doesn't eliminate the fact that in magical worlds, giant things exist. A giant thing doesn't, doesn't, doesn't you know, magically or anti-magically uh, lose its capacity to be giant when it walks into an anti-magic sphere. That giant cobra is still a giant cobra. Its bite will still poison you and kill you. And it's important to understand that in that setting, giant things exist. You can have giant insects in an anti-magic sphere. Anti-magic does not mean you were suddenly thrust into our world where the square cubed law is, is something we have to pay attention to. It's the reason you can't have 40-foot bugs. They don't exist. Kaiju aren't here, with the exception, of course, of a certain friend of mine who, who's convinced that she is, in fact, Kaiju. Um, and uh, it, they don't exist here because they can't. But they can exist in a world of psychic powers or of uh, magic. And we all love them. We really do. I know a guy who regularly draws giant insects in a post-apocalyptic setting. And it drives me kind of buggy. You'll pardon the pun. Because giant sea insects don't, it can't exist in our world. Even in a world that has weird mutant powers, doesn't change the fact that the square cube law should still be applicable in a post-apocalyptic world. Because it's, it's here. And you can't have giant insects here. You don't get giant scorpions like they had in Damnation Alley. You just can't. They wouldn't be able to move. They would collapse under their own weight and they would die. Let's mention it's eating an insect. They don't have lungs, so they only get air passing through their systems, and that's not going to... It's very complex, but the point is, is that you can't have giant insects in our world. But you can in a world of magic or psionics, and they're going to still function when they enter an anti-magic sphere. So why am I talking about this? It's just something that popped into my head. The fact that that little bubble you create in the anti-magic sphere, which I think is a very strange tactical decision, um, because it travels with the user. So if you cast an anti-magic spell, it's centered on the caster, and as the caster moves around, that sphere moves with them. But if you can cast anti-magic, that's a pretty high-level spell, why would you want to remove the tactical advantage you have of having spells? Like I said, you better have a lot of mundane options backing you up. Because if you don't, you just put yourself in a situation where you may die. Because let's face it, lots of spellcasters, even high-level ones, aren't really all that tough physically. Some of them are glass cannons. Now, if you could cast anti-magic as an attack, so if you could go, poof, and then suddenly a sphere of anti-magic would land on an enemy, but not you, that would be different. Because you could still use your spells to harm them. For example, by summoning monsters and sicking them on them. So again, the monster's not going to cease to exist when it enters the anti-magic spell, because it's here. Now that could be argued. Some may say that a summon creature shouldn't be able to go in there. All right, fine. I think you may you may have a point. Maybe not. That's a point of contention. Maybe that's another video I'll talk to talk about that one. But it doesn't mean you can't use sling uh, sling very heavy things at them, produce items that could harm them. And of course, if you have eliminated the target in anti magic, it also means their their mooks are now outside that sphere. You eliminate their mooks, but the while the big baddie can't do anything. And so when the spell finally disappears, suddenly they're essentially alone. So as that kind of a spell, it would be very useful, but the spell as it's written is centered on the caster. So I think it's a very strange thing to do. I've also seen anti-magic spheres of, you know, uh, existing as in-place things. So it's been produced and it's put on a certain spot, and in that area, magic doesn't work. 
but it doesn't move. And I believe in Pathfinder First Edition, there's an entire zone on the map in Galarian where there is no magic. It's where guns were first invented and where guns then proliferated from that place, which makes kind of a lot of sense. Um, so that exists as well. But that doesn't stop giant creatures from wandering through there. Just because magic doesn't work in that area, the things of high fantasy still exist. So I want to talk to people about this. I want to get their opinions on, on anti-magic. How often do you use it? Uh, have you encountered it? It's not something I use very often for the very reason that it is, in fact, eliminating a lot of tactical advantages. Now, that's great if you want to eliminate a, you know the player character's uh, abilities, but it also means that your abilities have to now be completely mundane. Traps may still work, of course. Lots of traps will still function. There are attacks that still work, and there are things that exist. Like a construct should still function in an anti -magic, magic spell, I believe. I don't think constructs just stop when they walk in them. If you have a if you have a flesh golem, and a flesh golem enters an anti-magic sphere, I believe it still functions. I'm not 100% sure on that. If I'm wrong, please inform me. It's not the first time I've been wrong. It will not be the last. So, let's talk about the kind of quirky concept that anti-magic spells exist, but they are spells, and they are fueled by magic, even if they are creating a little void in the magic fabric of that universe. I find it delightfully strange. It makes me smile. Let's talk about it. <laughs>